A reversible figure is a drawing that is compatible with two interpretations that can shift back and forth. A perceptual set is uh, a readiness to perceive a stimulus in a particular way. In intentional, uh, inattentional blindness involves the failure to see fully visible objects or events in a visual display. And according to a feature detection theory, people detect specific elements and stimulus and build them up into recognizable forms, which is called a bottom-up processing. Subjective contours in a phenomenon whereby contours are perceived were, where none actually exist attributed to a top-down processing. Form perception involves top-down processing, and this is clearly emphasized by the Gestalt psychologist who demonstrated that the whole is more than the sum of their parts. The Gestalt principle of form perception include figure, ground, proximity, similarity, continuity, closure, and simplicity. The Gestalt emphasis is still felt in the study of perception as they had useful insights uh, and that have stood the test of time and raised important issues. More recently, researchers have focused on ways we distinguish between distal or stimuli outside of the body and proximal stimulus energies in pinging on sensory receptors. Um, stimuli people have, may develop perceptual hypothesis about the distal, distal stimulus that may be responsible for proximal stimulus, the effects of context. Depth perception involves the interpretation of visual cues that indicate how near or far away something is. And there are two types of clues that are used to make judgments of distance. Uh, monocular cues, which are clues from the single eye, and the binocular cues, which are uh, clues from both eyes when they converge together. Uh, binocular cues include uh, retinal disparity, objects within 25 feet project image of slightly different locations on the left and right retinas, thus each eye sees a slightly different view of the objects. Um, and convergence, uh, it's the feeling the eyes converge toward one another as they focus on a target. Monocular, uh, monocular cues may involve motion, parallax, uh, having images of objects at different distances moving across the retina at different rates, as well as feeling the accommodation or change in the shape of the lens as the eye focuses. Perceptual constancies are tendencies to experience a stable perception in the face of continually changing stimuli. So for example, when a person walks towards you, they get larger perceptually. Do you think they're growing? No, of course not. Constancies for shape, uh, size, brightness, hue, and location in space have been shown. Optical illusions involve an apparently inexplicable discrepancy between the appearance of a visual stimulus and its physical reality. Famous optical illusions include the Muller, the, the Muller liar illusion, the Ponzo illusion, the uh, Poggendorf illusion, the upside down T illusion, the Zollner illusion in the Ames room, and impossible figures. Uh, cultural differences and susceptibility to illusions such as the Muller liar and the uh, Poggendorf demonstrate the importance of perceptual hypothesis. In the Muller liar illusion, uh, measure these two lines and you'll see that the two vertical lines are exactly equal in length. Uh, and in the Muller liar illusion, the drawing on the left seems to be closer since it looks like an outside corner and uh, thrust towards you, whereas the drawing on the right looks like an inside corner thrust away from you. Given retinal image of the same length, you assume that the closer line is shorter. In the Ames room, the diagram to the right shows the room is actually construct how the room is actually constructed. However, with this hypothesis, because of this reasonable perceptual hypothesis, the normal perceptual adjustment made to preserve size uh, constancy lead to illusions described in the text. For example, uh, the naive viewers conclude that the one boy is so much smaller than the other when in fact he is uh, just merely closer. So let's explore our sense of hearing. 
the stimulus for the auditory system is the sound wave, which are actual vibrations of molecules. Sound waves must travel throughout some physical medium such as air. Like light waves, as sound waves are characteristic by their amplitude, their loudness, and their wavelength, their pitch and purity, which is timber. Uh, also, uh, with as with light, uh, characteristics of sound interact in sound perception. Wavelength is described in terms of frequency and is measured in cycles per second, or hertz. In general, the higher the frequency, more cycles per second, the higher the pitch. Amplitude is the description of sound pressure and is measured in decibels. Perceived loudness is higher with increasing decibel levels. The ear has three divisions. The external ear consists of the pina, which collects the sound. The middle ear consists of the mechanical chain made up of the three tiny bones in the ear, the hammer, the anvil, and the stirrup, known collectively as ossicles. The inner ear consists of the cochlea, a fluid-filled, coiled tunnel that contains the hair cells, the auditory receptors. The hair cells are lined up in the basilar membrane. The hair cells are lined up on a membrane that runs the length of the cochlea called the basilar membrane. Sound waves cause the bones of the middle ear to hit against the oval window, a covered opening of the cochlea, which sets the fluid inside in motion. The hair cells are stimulated with the movement of the basilar membrane and convert their physical stimulus into neural impulses that are sent through the thalamus to the auditory cortex located mostly in the temporal lobes. Han von Helmholtz in 1863 proposed that the perception of pitch corresponds to the vibration of different proportions or places along the basilar membrane. Thus, different places have different pitches, like keys on a piano. Other researchers proposed an alternate model. Rutherford in 1886, uh, called frequency theory, holds the perception of pitch corresponds to the rate or frequency at which the entire basilar membrane vibrates, causing the auditory nerve to fire at different rates for different frequencies. Thus, according to this frequency uh, theory, the brain... Um, it detects the frequency of tone by the rate at which the auditory nerve uh, fires. Like uh, with research in theories of color and vision, researchers argued that uh, these two competing theories for almost a century, and as it turns out, uh, both were valid. Uh, and um, in part, uh, they were reconciled by uh, Gorig von Besky, who in 1947, with his travel wave theory, basically said that the whole basilar membrane does move, but the waves peak at particular places depending on frequency. Music may actually affect functional and morphological change in the brain and may make one more sensitive to human emotions, which are reflected in speech prosody, or the timing of rhythm and human speech patterns. Now, let's look at taste and smell. Taste has its physical stimulus chemical substances that are dissolved in water. Receptors for taste are clusters of cells found in the taste buds, which line the trenches around tiny bumps on the tongue. These cells absorb chemicals, trigger neural impulses, and send information through the thalamus onto the cortex. The four primary tastes are sweet, sour, bitter, and salty, with uneven uh, distribution uh, throughout the tongue. Clearly, taste results from a complex bend of these, uh, blend of these four, as well as our learned and social processes. Smell, or smell which we call olfaction, operates much like the senses of taste. The physical stimuli are chemical substances carried in the air and that are dissolved in fluid, the mucus in the nose. 
Olfactory receptors are called olfactory cilia and are located in the upper portion of the nasal passages. The olfactory receptors synapse directly with the cells in the olfactory bulb at the base of the brain. Olfaction is the only sense, therefore, that is not rooted through the thalamus. Odors uh, are not easily classified. The primary odors have not really been delineated. Humans can distinguish about 10,000 odors, but for some reason have a hard time attaching names to odors quite frequently. Our senses of touch and the physical stimuli for touch are mechanical, thermal, and chemical energy that impinges on the skin. The skin has at least six types of sensory receptors, which are rooted through the spinal column to the brainstem. There they cross over mostly to the opposite side of the brain and project through the thalamus and onto the somatosensory cortex in the parietal, in the parietal lobe. Temperature is registered by free nerve endings in the skin that are specific for cold and warmth. Pain receptors are also mostly free nerve endings which transmit information to the brain via two types of pathways. The fast pathway that registered localized pain relays it to the brain in a fraction of a second, and the slow pathway that lags a second or two behind that carries less localized, longer-lasting aching or burning pain. Our other senses involve our kinesthetic and vestibular systems. Kinesis is uh, knowing the position of the various parts of the body, uh, and uh, it includes joints indicating how much they're bending, or the muscles, and the registration of uh, tautness or extension. The vestibular system responds to gravity and keeps you informed of your body's location in space. It provides your sense of balance and equilibrium. The semicircular canals make up large part of the vestibular system, and these are fluid-filled canals in that contain hair cells similar to those in the bis uh, vascular membrane. Uh, when your head moves, fluid moves, and moving the hair cells and uh, initiating neural signals that travel to the brain. And that now is our uh, conclusion of our lesson on sensation and perception.